Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two, Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four-wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do-it-yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have Matt Hodges. Matt is West Texas off-road, redneck ram, and just a hell of a nice guy. Anybody that knows him will attest to that. I'm, I'm sure of it. He's made a lot of friends in the industry over the, the years that he's been in it, and we're going to talk to him about his life and how he got involved in this. So, Matt, thank you for coming on board with Conversations. Hey. Thank you for having me, Rich. It's uh, it's an honor. It really is. Thank you. Well, I don't know about the honor part, but we're glad you're here. Well, so <laughs> so let's too. let's jump in with both feet. And, uh, you know, I've known you a long time, but there's a lot of stuff I'm sure I'm going to find out. So let's start off at the very beginning and let's, you know, let's discuss where you were born and raised. Um, I was born and raised right here in little old San Angelo, Texas. Um, it's not, I guess, little anymore, but uh, born and raised here. I left for a few years for the Marine Corps, then decided I wanted to get out on my own and was gone for about another year to work at a ski resort in Colorado. And then came back, and I've been here for, I go 25, 30 years now that I haven't left other than vacations. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk about those first early years there. If you were born and raised there, that means that uh, all your schooling was done there, and all of your influences were created there, or yeah. happened there. Were you were you studious? Were you mechanical? Were you athletic, or did you just kind of do your own thing? <laughs> Well, I was the uh, I was the son of a veterinarian. Oh, um, my dad uh, graduated from A and M at vet school and uh, moved here to San Angelo. They had me, so I grew up with a big influence of animal background. All of our friends called us the Hodges Family Zoo because we always had every kind of stray pet you could imagine, from raccoons to owls to bobcats to just odd dogs and cats so bobcats yeah a mountain lion even one time dang yeah a baby mountain lion is as big as a full-grown house cat by the way (laughs) but um animals are animals and and you fall in love with them so that was a big influence um but i was i was always the mechanic kid my mom and especially my mom would get so mad at me because I would take apart everything and figure out how it works and then put it back together. Um, I got in so much trouble because she came home one time and the lawnmower was apart in the driveway. To my credit, I cleaned out the cylinders and put it all back together and had it running before dark. So, Well, very good. Let's see. I was not a great student. I have been blessed with a fairly high IQ, but that proves the point that you do not have to be smart to have an IQ. Um, <laughs> I was terrible at school. I could uh, I could pull my shit together, or sorry, I could pull my stuff together, 
at the end of the year and take final tests and pass, but I did not want to do the schoolwork during the rest of the year, and it drove my parents crazy. Um, I always did just enough to just barely get by so that I had time to go hunting and fishing and work on stuff and things like that during the rest of the time. So what was your earliest mode of transportation? Bicycle, wow. motorcycle, oh, ATV? Earliest, earliest is going to be a bicycle. bicycle. You know, we had, to, we had to ride a bicycle to, to school and back. Red, white, and blue. I mean, your parents and didn't drive you to school? No, we only lived about, well, all I can remember is elementary school, and we only lived about five or six blocks from the elementary school, oh, okay. so I rode every day. It wasn't a big deal. We lived in town, pretty close to the Air Force Base. I can still remember back in the 70s, you could still hear the, the jets flying over and breaking the sound barrier, which you, you can't do anymore. They made it illegal, or at least here in West Texas, they did. Most places, I, I believe. Yeah, they... Uh, Side note, they made it illegal here because it was breaking all the water tanks. The shock wave would transfer through the water and break all the concrete and stone tanks. Oh. So, anyway, um, first mode was uh, was a bicycle. Red, white, and blue with a banana seat. Uh, first powered transportation, I guess technically was, a, I don't know, a late 60s, early 70s. FJ-40, um, it was given to me as a gift, but it was used as a tractor. It had a PTO output and it had uh, post hole diggers and stuff like that. And we used it around the farm. So, How many times did you take it apart? <laughs> um, I was given strict rules that I could not touch that. <laughs> yeah, uh, very strict rules that I couldn't do it. And, but it, honestly, it didn't last long. It got moved on to something else, and then I guess my first highway vehicle was the uh, a 1976 Ford F350 with a 460 and a manual four-speed, and uh, driving it down the road. I can remember driving it on the highway to the ranch at 11 years old, and you could physically watch the gas gauge move. <laughs> so, I know most people don't get to drive on the highway at 11, but in small town West Texas, things are a little bit different. Right. So San Angelo is like right on the edge of West Texas. I would say Correct. it's I would say in that that central part of the of Texas, it's probably the the first yeah, metropolitan the area. Yeah, the eastern edge of West Texas. Yes. Or the western edge of central Texas, something like that. Yeah, just beginning of the, the hill country. Yeah, yeah. So from that pickup truck, you said you did a lot of hunting and fishing. I would imagine that was your, uh, was that your mode of transportation at that point, going out hunting yeah. and fishing? Yes, sir. And what, we, kind of, uh, what kind of critters did you uh, hunt? Oh, anything that I could. You know, you give a... A young boy, a, a 22 or something like that, that he can carry around. And I would walk the rivers and walk the pastures, and nothing was safe. <laughs> Which you look back on now, and you kind of feel bad about just just shooting everything that moved. But I think I learned a lot more about animal management and caring for the wildlife. Because you grew up gaining a respect Right. You know, being a son of a veterinarian, you know, and he loved animals, but he taught me to hunt. And it's just, uh, yeah, I have, I, have a, I have a big nature streak now and want to take care of everything. So good. I think being out and doing crazy stuff out in the wildlife and seeing how wonderful it is made me have a better respect for it, to love it, and to want to take care of it. Okay. So let's talk about that F-350. How long did you have that for? Said so you were 11 or thereabouts? Yeah, for a few years. Um, I started I started driving it to high school when I could. And then uh, I think when I turned, I lost my father to a, a drunk driver when I was 15. Oh. And so we really couldn't afford to buy much after that. And then uh, 
high school, I was going to a small town called Wall, Texas. I think there was 48 people in my graduating class. My mother bought me an S10 Blazer when I turned, I think it was when I turned 18. It was either 17 or 18, but uh, I drove that Ford up until that point. Okay. I would imagine they stayed pretty much stock. Pretty much. Uh, the bed rotted off of it, and we put a flat bed on it. Okay. Other than that, it was pretty well stock, you know. Had, you know, you, you look back now and you think, I can't believe I, I, be, I sold it. You know, I don't remember what I sold it for. I think it was like 800 bucks when I sold it. I'm like, I can't believe I sold a truck with a Ford Kingpin Dana 60 for 800 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, you know, at, at 17, 18 years old, you didn't know what a Ford Kingpin Dana 60 was. Or what it was going to be used for later on. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine you're of the age where Jeeps at that time were still stock-ish. Yep. Everybody, you yep. know, nobody changed out that those 30 and 35s. Um, yep. Oh, here it was 27s, you know, 28s. <laughs> it was around San Angelo. It was big if it had 30s on it. Right. I got out of the Marine Corps, ended up buying a four-cylinder YJ later on, and, and kept that for many years. You, you actually saw that vehicle. Was that the yellow one? Yeah, that was the yellow one. Okay. And uh, I can remember when I put, I did a spring over and put 35s on it. Everybody around, all my friends, and was like, man, that's crazy. You know, why do you need something that big? That's just crazy. So... Because it gets all the girls. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about uh, Wall, Texas. Um, I, I would imagine that you went there because you guys moved after your dad passed away. Is that Would that be correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, uh, we mo- had to move. Um, wow, that must have been kind of traumatic. And Yeah, it was. It was. You know, especially at, at the age of 15, you're kind of at that crossroads in your life where you're trans still transitioning from being a boy into a young man. And, uh, you know, you, you, you have all those questions and, uh, you need that birds and the bees talk and you need some, some hard lessons and, you know, screw ups and, and all those things. So, and you didn't have an older brother. I did not have an older brother. I had a younger sister, but, uh, not that an wasn't going to help. <laughs> No, no, didn't help. That was a little rough, but it turned out okay. Yeah. And uh, I went, I had to learn some lessons the hard way. But, you know, when the, when you learn them the hard way, you usually retain them. They're, they're, they're learned good, as less, you would say. Less likely to repeat. Repeat, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then uh, after Wall... Did you step right into the military? Yep. Okay. A mom, I knew mom couldn't afford to send two of us to college, and I'm not a college guy anyway. I tried a few times after the Marine Corps, but I knew she couldn't afford it. I, like I said earlier, I, I test well. I'm not a very good studier, but I test well, and I tested, you know, did the ASVAB or whatever, and they said they promised me a great job and ended up being in intelligence, which – it's just Matt Hodges Marine, and intelligence. Marine I love Corps that. intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> Marine Corps intelligence is just asinine to me, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I studied to be an Arabic linguist, wow. um, in the Marine Corps. Did you retain any of it? Oh, a little bit. I could probably still like, ask for a cup of coffee and, you know, as any young man, you're always going to retain the curse words first. So I could probably <laughs> give somebody a good cussing. <laughs> Where did you end up serving? Monterey, California for over a year. And then uh, Camp Lejeune, Camp Geiger, North Carolina. Actually, I stopped in uh, Aurora, Colorado for, I don't know, six or nine months. And they put me through drawing class or graphics classes. And I'm not sure what that was about, why they sent me there. But so I did really well at drawing graphic stuff. And I think it was to draw maps, um, okay. but then uh, was sent to North Carolina and uh, was stuck with a tow gunner group. 
we were doing, um, I think about a 20 mile march on the beach and we were walking up, the, uh, humping up a sand dune. The backpack that they wear in the Marine Corps is called the Alice pack and it has a, a lumbar support bar and that uh, pushed against my lower back just the right way and slipped a disc out of place. It pinched the nerve going down to my legs, the sciatic nerve, and I went flat on my face. That started a chain of events where they medically discharged me from the Marine Corps. So I actually never made it over to the Middle East. I never got to see any action, kind of disappointing. But um, I spent about two and a half years in and then got sent home. Wow. Okay. But at least you got some education out of it. And whether you're using your Arabic linguistics in San Angelo, that's another story. Not in San Angelo. Um, I have have a friend that makes fun of me that it seems like every time we go on a trip, I find somebody at a truck stop to talk to. Oh, I would imagine at a truck stop. Yeah. (laughs) That probably freaks those people out. (laughs) Yeah. When you walk up behind somebody and say good morning, and or or excuse me or thank you in Arabic and they you know they they back up and answer you in Arabic and then they turn around and they see this red headed pale faced white kid they're like really shocked. So that's awesome. <laughs> so out of the military, what did you uh you said you did a, a little bit of college? I tried college. I went to some engineering classes and um I did some online stuff through Texas Tech. And then there's a community college here in town for uh, AutoCAD and drafting. I tried that. And I'm just not, I'm not made for a classroom. I'm more of a hands-on, learn it from somebody one-on-one type of guy. Or I'm, I'm pretty good at teaching myself things. But I tried that and it just didn't work. I, uh, I became a mechanic as a night job to help pay for schooling and that kind of took off and I did that for quite a while ended up driving a bus for a special needs school system and I'll, I will have to say that that was probably the most rewarding job I've ever done really um, yeah the those special needs kids were were some of the best kids I've ever met in my entire life I ended up leaving because one of my one of my student or one of my kids, You know, just a kid that rode my bus, but he was one of my kids, passed away. And I I don't remember. He was seven or eight years old. It it broke me. And uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't take it anymore. So I had to walk away. I I remember thinking, I can't do this again. So I, uh, and that's when I moved. I'd had so much fun in Colorado in the Marine Corps while I was there at Aurora. Air Force Base that, I'm sorry, Lowry Air Force Base in Aurora, that I decided I was going to just move and start over. I'd had a bad breakup with a girlfriend at the same time. So I moved up to Breckenridge, Colorado and worked for worked for the Keystone Corporation. Uh, they own like three ski resorts up there, Keystone, Breckenridge, and Arap- Arapaho Basin. And uh, drove a bus and got to meet new people every day and have fun and go skiing. And it was a great year. And after the season was over, I came back to San Angelo with the intentions of going back. But I don't remember. I, I met a girl and started a new job. And I think I started driving a truck, working on trucks. and, and Bigger yeah, than an F-350? <laughs> no, I'm talking Peterbilt's. <laughs> But I just never left again. Worked on trucks, and then they needed a driver, so I drove trucks. And then decided I didn't want to be alone in a truck anymore all day long. Came back, and uh, I started, uh, let's see, at that point, I started doing electrician work. I got hired on the company that a buddy of mine worked at. He left not long after that, and I stayed on with them for a couple of years. And uh, thought that that was going to be my my forever job. I was really good with uh, with running wires, especially control panels and things like that. I could sit down on a, on a stool with all my wires and zip ties and labels and 
I could let my OCD flourish, make all those panels look really professional. I guess and, that uh, proves that I do not, that I'm not OCD. <laughs> oh, I, I always wish that I could, uh, that I could spend the time to do wiring and anything like that, any detail work. Yeah. To the skill um, or to the level of that I see so many people do. I'm more like, okay, let's just get this done and move on to the next thing. Right. And if you look under the hood of of my vehicles, you'll completely understand that. I'm the one that says that I'm the one that's in those memes that says, my God, I can't believe somebody would drive a vehicle that has this much wire in it. <laughs> but if anybody ever breaks down on a trail and says, hey, I need a piece of wire, I know I've got extra. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it. I absolutely love doing that stuff. The problem is, is if you interrupt me while I'm trying to do that, I explode. I just, I want to be completely left alone. So, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that guy that explodes at people. So I don't do a whole lot of it. Understood. But when my father had been killed when I was 15, um, after school was out, my mom needed to, you know, do a lot of traveling and take care of the estate. My dad had a lot of business ventures. He was mainly a mainly a vet, but there was a, a lot more to it than that. Um, but she had to do a lot of traveling to help take care of things. And she was trying to find her new way in the world. You know, she had uh, she needed to figure out what she was going to do to make a living and things like that. So she sent me to for the summer. She let me go to my uncle's in Arkansas, and uh, immediately he got tired of watching me mope around and feeling sorry for myself all day long. So he started putting me to work. He gave me a 46 and a 48 Willis and said, here you go, put them together, make one. And so I did. I spent the first half of that summer, or first two-thirds of that summer, learning how to take apart and reassemble CJ two A's. Nice. So then the last third of the summer, I got to drive it around in the river bottoms of Arkansas, south of Fort Smith. So you had a 46 and a 48. So you ended up yeah. with a 47. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the Johnny cash version. There you One go. Piece of but, uh, when I, when my mother came to pick me up at the end of the summer, he sent me home with it, gave me a trailer and, and actually both Jeeps, all the extra parts from the other one, and uh, sent me home with them. And I kept those for many years. Wow. That's awesome. Um, I, I did sell it, but I still know the, the guy that owns it. He's here in town. Him and his daughter love going to the ranch and getting in it and driving around the ranch. And I would never want to take that away from him. But, you know, I've asked him that if he ever gets rid of it, that I would like it back. So, cool. Um, but after that, I, you know, I kind of fallen in love with the Jeep stuff. I had that yellow Jeep while I was an electrician, still a four cylinder spring over with 35s. I got in a big argument one time with my boss and I was just, I was done with it. I quit. And, uh, I had a buddy that had a rhino lining dealership here in San Angelo that he didn't use the showroom at all. He only used the back area to spray bed liners. And so I asked him if I could share the shop, split the rent with him. And he said, yeah. So I decided I was going to start an off-road shop. He would spray bed liners during the day and I would watch the front. And then when he would be done spraying pickup beds, then I could use the shop floor to work on stuff. If it was an overnight job, it had to stay outside. And, you know, I'm doing clutches on asphalt it is not fun because Transmission jacks don't roll very well on asphalt. And West but, Texas gets warm. And West Texas gets warm. You know, I was, I don't know, I was probably 20, 26, 27 at the time. So much younger, and I could handle that a lot better then. But uh, you did what you had to do, and I loved it. And it just grew and grew and grew from there. And that was 99, 1999. All right. And it, at that point, did you call it West Texas Off-Road? I did. There's also 
I actually got a letter in the mail saying that they were going to sue me for using that name after I had gone to the county and asked them to do a, a name search and all of that. They still said they were going to sue me. There was a place in Midland, Odessa area called West Texas Off-Road Center, but they called themselves West Texas Off-Road. And I called them, and in the end, they were polite about it. You know, lawyers get involved, and they always sound really gruff in letters. But uh, when you're face-to-face -face with somebody, most people are reasonable. So I changed my name to West Texas Four-Wheel and Off-Road, kind of like the magazine that used we used to have Peterson's four wheel and off road. Right. So I was West Texas four wheel and off road and they were West Texas off road center, but we still both call ourselves West, West Texas off road. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah. It's and they're still that. in business too. Yeah. They're still in business too. Wow. They just do things like, uh, accessories like bumpers and grill guards and toolboxes and stuff like that. Yeah. Being in that, that oil area. That's yeah. Yeah. Flat beds and great, dress yeah, them up. They do, they do a great job for what they do. So. Perfect. So let's talk about the growth of West Texas off-road over the years. Okay. Well, let's see. Started in 99, you know, and just I signed on and got as many dealers, you know, dealer accounts as I could. And it was probably mid-2000 I did uh, – my first axle swap on my Jeep, and I think it was probably a Dana 44 and a 9-inch, and put some old used groundhogs on it, um, like 38-inch groundhogs. And they were so out of round, I couldn't control it. you get death wobble really bad. So I started trying to figure out what I'm going to do to help control big tires. And because I had loved, you know, mechanical things as a younger kid, I used to watch a lot of the Baja stuff and I could remember seeing Baja trucks. And now I know that they were probably either Hal or Lee um, Ram assist steering kits on some of those Baja trucks. And, you know, like the old Ford Bombardier trucks and the old Thunderbirds and Corvettes, they had those power assist Rams on the steering. That was the first power steering for those cars and trucks. And so I started tearing apart gearboxes and trying to figure out how to do that. And I built one for myself. And then there was a guy here in town named Tony Palmer that had a big FJ40 on with a V8 and 44s and stuff like that. And he was my first real customer. And then several other guys from here in San Angelo, I did theirs. And Tony was a, Tony was a big internet guy. He loved to be on the internet all the time. And at the time that was still a pretty new thing to me, but uh, he posted something on a forum called pirate four by four and never uh, heard of her. Right. <laughs> Man, I started getting phone calls and emails and stuff asking, Hey, we saw that you did this for this guy. I want one. It wasn't, it wasn't like a week after that. You know, some of the magazines have the new product, lines that are coming out we saw one of the other companies agr was selling the rock ram i was like well that's interesting that's basically the same thing so i called i decided well instead of making these i'll just sell them so i called agr and wanted to be a dealer you know it's like hey i'm making these i've been selling them but you guys are a bigger name and i know the name will help sell things let me sell them they said, sure, no problem, and sent me a price list. And I called him back. I said, uh, uh, can you give me a, a, a dealer or maybe a wholesale level price list? And they said, well, that is the wholesale level price list. And I kind of chuckled, and I was like, this is too much. You know, I can make it and sell it and have a good profit for half this amount. And uh, I don't remember the salesman's name at the time, but he's like, if you're so good at it, then do it. <laughs> so I, I love it. motivation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, best way to tell me to, you know, make me do something is tell me I can't do it or, you know. Yep. So, or challenge me. So away I went. And here we are, 22, this October will be 22 years of uh, being in business and 
Daytona Rams. That's been a, that's been a big deal. Right. We, uh, we work very hard to try to have a great product at a reasonable price without breaking the bank. And you're not just doing the Jeep or, or, you know, those, those style, um, no, not at all. boxes and everything you're doing, you're doing just about everything, aren't you? Yeah, we have, uh, we have, I don't know, hundreds, I would say customers that live up in like Montana or Idaho or things like that, that just have ranch trucks with snow plows on them. And you can't, you know, you start pushing snow, you can't turn. And so you put a ram on it so you can turn. A lot of those guys that run those mat track vehicles up in the snow, you, you can't turn those things. So we put a ram, a ram on them so they can turn. We've helped. I love doing one-off weird stuff. And so I've helped guys with like vans that are disabled, you know, polio victims or, or, paraplegics or things like that you know and work with them and build a steering system so they can steer or you know even those guys getting them in a jeep that they couldn't steer a jeep before you know build something custom for them so even if they have two percent strength in their arms you know they can barely lift their arms they can still steer so i love doing off the wall stuff like that but i mean mainly it's just it's just about making the driving experience better. I even have it on my, uh, my Dodge mega cab that has stock size tires on it just so it runs better down the highway, pulling a trailer. Okay. Makes sense. So the location that you're at in San Angelo, is that, how long have you been in that location? Oh, 15 years, 14 or 15 years, I've been in this location. Okay. Previous location, the building itself had been bought out. I had just, when it came up for sale, I had just bought some other stuff and didn't have the money to buy the building out there and regretted it because the new owner added a zero to the to the back of the rent. And um, so it went, it went up 10 times, which was crazy so we started looking for a new place we found this and it was an old tire store from the 70s and it's a it's a great place it's in town i get a lot of traffic it's about a quarter of a, a small city block so um, it's been a good location but I, I managed to actually buy it and so i don't have to worry about ever getting kicked out again right and you have the showroom there. You have facilities to R and R and do work on vehicles, all sorts of work. And then you yeah. also have your manufacturing facility, which I think you're sitting in now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's you're not doing any it. box work right now, right? <laughs> I'm not. No. Um, and it's funny to call it a manufacturing facility. Um, it's a C container. It's a 40 foot C container that I've, built like a little office annex on the side of it that's eight foot long and four foot wide and i sit in here with an air compressor and a big cnc lathe and a bunch of aluminum and steel i make it run parts all day long i have some great guys that run the front and better at being salespeople than i am i just want to sit there and talk and do stuff all day long so back here i get to draw in computer CAD and and then tell the computer to talk to the lathe and then the lathe makes parts so I just have to keep the keep it running keep the machine fed you know, we also have on the property there was a little filling station a little bitty like one room filling station that you saw from the 60s and 70s right I own that also. And it used to be a can recycling place. There was a homeless guy that lived in it and did can recycling. And I let him stay there for probably five or six years after we moved in because he didn't have any place to go. After a while, I told him, I said, okay, we I've got plans for this building. I'm going to give you time, but you need to find a place, you know? And, and it was funny. The guy 
I, I shouldn't say it's funny, but it, it's fortuitous. He burst into tears and s said that he had, he had just, he'd been saving money and he just got his own place. So it, it worked out well. Timing is everything. Right. But I, I bought a, a hand, you know, a manual lathe and mill and, and put it in there and got the AC working over there and painted all the windows white so you couldn't see it anymore and redid the installation, made it okay in there and started doing other things. And, uh, you know, I said earlier, I like to hunt and fish and things like that. And so I had been into varmint hunting at the time and going out at night and calling, calling foxes and stuff like that in. And part of that is you're trying to be as quiet as possible and a big loud gunshot goes off and you're pretty much done. You got to pick everything up and go find a different spot. And so I started trying, I started working towards being as quiet as possible. You know, you, you can buy silencers and, and stuff for firearms. And I, I, I got those pretty quiet, but I started machining parts for an air gun that I bought. It's a big bore air rifle. It's 357 caliber. I got it even quieter, and then you play around on the internet and you show pictures of what you've done. On the, on the, there's a forum for everything. No matter what you do, there's somebody out there that has an internet forum for it. So oh, true enough. I was on the Aragon forums and kind of posted something I did, and it was the same way with the Rams. I, you know, people saw it and like, hey, I want one of those. So now I own an Aragon business also, and we uh, we make. So in the air gun business, they're called moderators, not silencers. And that's kind of legal purposes because for an air gun moderator, you don't have to have any kind of license or anything because it's not a firearm, but it right. also can't, it can't be easily fitted to a firearm. Okay. And so we 3D print them and they can handle the air pressure, but they couldn't be mounted to a firearm anyway. And so we 3D print those and sell a lot of them and uh, we uh, tune air guns, and I have a, a guy that used to have a TV show on the Outdoor Channel called American Air Gunner that he runs that business because it turned into a business, and I didn't have time to do anything else. So I brought him in, and he runs a show over there, and it's to me it's still just a hobby, but it actually makes money for them, and they can, uh, you know, gives him a, a way to make a living. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. So then what else are you doing at, at West Texas Off-Road besides steering and the the air gun stuff? You're doing R&R &R work and building one-offs or anything? Um, a little bit. 99% of it is just the average everyday stuff that any off-road shop would do, lift kits, leveling kits, tires and wheels and just maintenance there's always people breaking stuff um a lot of a lot of maintenance from hunting vehicles because there's lots of hunters that come in from out of state and have hunting leases here and things get tore up and so we fix a lot of that kind of stuff um but occasionally we still get to do the you know the fun stuff Every once in a while, I'll get a hankering and build myself something new. I, uh, I've built myself a new YJ. You know, you get to watch, you get to look at all the things that other people do and you let those stir in your head and, and you, you like this guy's idea, but you don't like what he did here. And then another guy, you like how he set this up, but you don't like how he set the other thing up. And you take all those ideas and eventually they, they boil to a head and you got to put all those ideas on something so i have a few vehicles that i've built myself i have a, a really large fj cruiser i think there's uh there's a guy in california that's building one as big right now but up until that it was the biggest fj cruiser that i could find in the world that still had all of its body so it was one tons and 40s but it still had all of its body you didn't um, even have to cut tire the fenders for clearance. Well, okay, clearance. I, okay, I did, I did trim a little bit of fender, but I didn't have to cut into the interior of the body okay. at all. Cool. There's bigger ones, but they had to cut inside. Right, retub and all that. Yeah. But we 
you know, we still do some one-off stuff and I enjoy it, but I've also learned that I need to do what I'm really good at and try to be the best that I can be at that and let other people that are good at stuff. There's so many good fab shops now that do buggies and, and things like that, that I don't, I don't really want to try to compete with those guys. They do an awesome job. Right. That makes sense. You have Jesse Haynes and you have the Campbells and other, well, I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. There's so many good ones out there that I just don't want to even try to compete with them. I think those guys are doing a great job. I try to do what I do and try to be the best at it that I can be. I could probably come up with 10,000 different products to try to put on an internet site and just sell parts, but I'm not happy doing that. Right. So let's go backtrack to the early years. How did you get hooked up with Shane and Randy at Katemsi? At Katemsi, yeah. Shane Chapman and Randy Cruzy. Yeah. Uh, great guys. Awesome guys. Absolutely. Because that's how we met. We met there at, yeah. at Katemsi, at the yeah. first Katemsi. Yeah, K1. K1. That's been, what, 20 years ago? Yes. Yep. Um, let's see. I don't remember if it was Jeff Smith or Quaid that he runs another company here in town. I don't remember. Somebody came by the shop and said, hey, I have some buddies down in Mason that are thinking about opening up an off-road park would you be interested in going down and looking at what they're doing and giving them some pointers? I'm like, sure, absolutely. You know, and I'd only been in business for a couple of years. I'd been wheeling for, oh, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so. But I, you know, and, and my wheeling, wheeling then and wheeling now is <laughs> so different that it shouldn't even be called the same thing. But yeah, I, I went down and I met those guys and, we immediately became buddies. Those guys are as good as gold. You'll you just can't get a better group of guys. Yeah, that's that's how I met them. We went down just, you know, just kind of trying to give them some pointers on what to do, and they already knew. Uh, Randy is such a good um, event coordinator type of guy. You know, he'd already been doing oh he'd been doing barbecue stuff and and setting up events to do, take people on, or his dad was taking people out on fishing trips and doing, being a guide. And I think Randy had already done some of that. And he's just a natural people person. True. It doesn't matter who you are or what background you've got. Randy can carry on a conversation with you. Um, he is then, the uh, Hank Hill yes. <laughs> of the Hill Country. And he literally sold propane and propane accessories. Yep, and cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and cell phones. And then Shane is is such a good guy too. True. Um, it's, you know, and he could he could take care of all the legal side of it. Luckily in Texas, the legal side's a lot easier to go along with than some places. But uh, like almost anywhere. Yeah. yeah, but they're great couple of guys, and and Randy's whole family that helps run that. You know, I got to watch his son and daughter grow up going down there. And now my youngest son is 11, and I just bought him a, uh, <laughs> I bought him a 1985 Toyota mini truck with a Marlin crawler box, uh, air lockers, um, chromoly shafts, Burfields, I think. I'm not sure. I haven't taken it apart, but you know, I'm I'm super excited for him because he bought somebody else's project that had a blown up engine and we rebuilt the motor in it together and uh, it's ready to go. I've like any day now we're going to load it up and take it out. And uh, I look forward to taking him down to Katempsey and, and letting him grow up around that whole crowd again. That's awesome. So you've been a, uh, you're not vehicle specific. You've owned Jeeps, you've owned Toyotas, you got a Unimog. Do you still have a Unimog? I just gave it to Kenny Hawk. Oh, out at you? Hawk Designs. I just gave it to him. I, I just got back from a trip about a week ago. Um, and I hauled it out there to Pennsylvania. Um, I did an episode with them where we did an install on a Jeep. 
and I, I, I took it with me and gave it to him. Because every time he'd come through here, he was always looking at it. And they did a Unimog for, uh, they did a big Unimog for Bill Stein shocks. And uh, so and he kept talking about mine. And I finally was just like, you know what? It's just sitting there rotting away. Nobody, nobody wants to ride with me in it. And uh, I just gave it to him. I, I was, I wanted somebody to do something with it. So cool. So let's uh, let's go in that direction. Um, you've uh, you've made friends with some TV personalities over the years, and helped them with projects. Talk about some of the uh, those experiences and and who you've worked with. Yeah, I I guess I, it's, I can remember the first time I went to an actual TV show. That was the Diesel Brothers, and. Um, you know that's not true. It was it was Kenny Hawk. He was uh, on Discovery Channel, I believe, and was with him. And that was the first time that I was actually on TV, I believe. But I also learned that I don't think I want would ever want to do that. To be on I, TV, uh, be it well, be on air, a, like, be an on air personality. Yeah, right. Or have you know have a show about my shop or something like that? They even because I I I like to always be the be a laugh of the crowd and tell jokes and have a good time. And um, the producer that was there ended up calling me later on and wanting to do an interview with my whole crew. He did, and he had a great time listening to us and meeting everybody and things like that. And at the end of it, I had a little private call with him and a. He asked if I would be interested in doing it. And I, I had to flat out tell him, as as long as you can promise me there's not going to be any more drama in my life than I have right now, <laughs> then I'm all for it. But they but always gonna... want to create drama. Yeah. And that's what I see everywhere I go is those guys just want to create drama. And then I went to... Uh, that's that damn with... formula they have for... Yeah reality well they call it reality tv but i call it fakeality yeah and it's and I, fakeality yeah and i've turned down so many projects over the years because of them wanting you know these producers wanting to juice up the idea i mean at one time little rich and i you know when that american chopper was going on with the tuttles you know yeah. people were approaching us hey you know you guys could do this and we could have these big arguments and do the same kind of thing, but in the four wheel drive industry. And we looked at him and went, no, <laughs> we don't, we're not interested in that. And, yeah. you know, same thing with the competition side. And I just won't change what I do for that, you know, 15 minutes of fame, you might say. Yeah, exactly. I'd rather have the 21 years we've had than one or two years on TV you know, raking it in, maybe, maybe, um, you know, maybe sell some extra merchandise or whatever, and then right. have to deal with life afterwards. Yep. Yeah, I'm the same way. You know, I got the worst one was when I went to uh, the Diesel Brothers, and I ended up I'm I'm on an episode, but all you can see is like my arm, the side of my arm and my shoulder while I'm having a conversation with Dave Sparks and that, you know, they're kind of on him and that you can hear me talking to him, but you can't see me. So, and then like the top of my head while I'm working on something, but that, that place and those guys are super nice, but the drama that had to go on behind the scenes was, was like comical and idiotic. Um, and he, you know, there was one time where they, the guy kept telling Dave and I guess Dave Sparks and Diesel Dave, they were escorting somebody into the shop and they made him walk into the shop like 10 times. And Dave started talking about how stupid this was, you know, and he's, he's not a cusser or anything like that, but he was very vocal and he's not afraid to say what he thinks the show producer or editor or whatever was like, uh, Dave, that microphone's still on. And he said, I know he didn't care, but he was getting sick <laughs> part of it too. Um, but the drama, the, you know, the fake drama 
that that has to go on behind the scenes is ridiculous. And um, and then you're kind of dangling on the end of a string. Like I went up there. Uh, what we had the Moab Four by Four Expo last October. Right. And then I went up and did a ram on the Bro Camino for Diesel Dave. And um, I guess that was election day. But there were times where me and my buddy John Linden and my wife were the only ones in the shop. Everybody, you know, we're in a multi-million dollar shop with millions of dollars worth of vehicles. And we're the only ones there because of COVID stuff. They had not been recording anything at all. And so they had let a lot of people go and it was just really slow. Um, and that was sad. You know, you kind of dangling on, on the end of their string. And once, once they said, Oh, we can't come anymore. Then you're, you're done. Exactly. Oh, you know, I'm, I, you know, during all this, the past year has just been crazy with all the people trying to mandate how you live your life and things like that. I, uh, it's just been crazy. And I never shut down. I never made, I refuse to force my employees to do something that they don't want to do. And every one of them that wanted to stay home, I let them stay home. And when I got COVID, I, that was over Christmas holiday. So I stayed home. And uh, when I got sick and tired of sitting at the house doing stuff, I would I would call the shop and say, hey, I'm going to drive up there and I'm going to go into my machine shop. Y'all stay away from me. And so, I, you know, I quarantined at work in my little so-called machine shop out here. Just so you wouldn't but, go stir crazy. Stir crazy, yeah. But, um, but as far as the media stuff goes, I, I would never want to do that. It's fun to be guest appearances, um, but I never, I don't, I don't care about being on TV anymore. It was really cool the first couple times to see yourself, but yeah, I got over it really quick. Right. Um, I just came back from like, I went to Pennsylvania to Kenny Hawks. And then from there I had to go down to Florida. Um, I had that trip planned. Um, and there were some bad things that happened and I ended up, it, it, it made the trip bittersweet, but there's a, there's a YouTube show down there called faster proms and, <laughs> um, faster I, proms. Yeah. Faster proms. Okay. So like in the nineties, you didn't, you didn't plug your car into a computer and tune it. You actually had a, a, a you, you know, we called it chipping, but right. it was a prom chip and, um, I guess the, the company, the guys, Jeremy's dad started it and he, uh, that's how he started is he would flash those proms and send them to you. Like you'd call him and say, Hey, I put a blower and I did a cam and I did all this stuff. And he would send you a series of these proms. You'd plug them in and you'd say, okay, this one worked well. And then, you know, they would send back and forth and tune. Well, he's, he, now he does tuning and everybody's heard of Cletus McFarland. Um, I think his first name is Garrett, but everybody's heard of Cletus, Cletus and cars, Cletus McFarlane. Okay. Um, he's got a big YouTube show now, but, uh, they shared a shop together. He did all the tuning for Cletus, but one of his guys is building a big, huge JK. It's an LS motor with a blower. And, and I don't remember if he's, I think he said 650 horsepower that he's trying to build out of it, but it may be, it may be 850. I, I don't remember, but he needed some help trying to figure out, how to do the steering. He'd got a set of those new DS track axles that are coming in from overseas. He didn't have any idea how to set that up. So I spent a few days down there helping him. And filming for YouTube, his YouTube channels. Yeah. Filming for his YouTube channel. And, and I kept telling him, I don't care if I'm on your YouTube channel. I really don't. It's not about, it's not about being on, on screen for me. It's about coming and helping out and making the off-road community a better place. Right. You know, I, I was going to go to Florida anyway. Um, I bought an, <laughs> I'm trying to start another hobby. I bought a ultralight aircraft and it just happened to be right there. And so I went down to do that. So then you, you bought an ultralight aircraft. Yeah. So like a fixed wing 
yes. or kite type? Uh, fixed wing. Fixed wing. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. If you want to, if you want to look it up, it's called a uh, a buccaneer. Okay. And it's an amphibious aircraft that you can land on the water or on land. Does it have a really good glide ratio? Yes, it does. Good. That's one of the things I, I, I why I'm against flying small planes. Right. <laughs> I'm just, I'm not a big fan of flying in anything. Yeah. I've only, I've only done helicopter. God, I guess I've only been up in the helicopters twice, and it was on the same day. And that's when we went up north or into, went hunting, pig hunting. Yeah. With uh, some guys, and we did did it from a helicopter up in Oklahoma. But yeah, I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a big fan of getting my feet off the ground. You might say. <laughs> well, my father was a pilot. He got. He was a veterinarian, but he was also he he was a pioneer in what's called embryo transfers. Okay. Artificial insemination. He pioneered a lot of that stuff back in the eighties, late seventies, early eighties. But um, we would like load up all the gear and fly out to a ranch somewhere. And so he would let me fly with him and give me lessons and let me fly. And we'd play blackjack and poker while we flew. And so I would fly while he read his hand and then he would fly while I read my hand. And I, and I really fell in love with it. And, um, after he passed, I didn't get to fly with him anymore. Uh, but I also had a, one of my best friends in high school was, uh, he's a certified instructor. He used to teach at, a, at an academy before nine 11 and then went to an air ambulance and went, then now he works for one of these private corporations that you can lease on uh, like a Learjet or something. And he's your pilot. Okay. But whenever he was in town, the company he worked for would basically pay for him to, or I think they would pay for him to rent an airplane to keep all of his flight hours up. And he would take me out and give me lessons and things like that. And I enjoyed that time with him also, but I've always loved being up in the air. I don't know why. I don't know if it's a feeling like you're closer to God thing or just a a free spirit thing. I, I can't put my finger on it, but I've always loved it and I've missed it. So I'm going to just try new things. I get it. I am not going to just jump in and try to take off without taking some li- some lessons. Um, <laughs> I've already made some phone calls and started setting up classes so that I can actually work towards getting a license. I know most ultralights, you do not have to have a license to uh, a pilot's license anyway to fly them. So, but I, I promised my wife that I would be super safe. And uh, so I'm going to take some lessons before I just jump in. I think that's why I ended up with a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Land and water. Um, you know, I, I'm a strong swimmer. I, I can I can walk. I can hike. Not that I prefer to do that. I'd rather drive. But, uh, you know, if something happens, I can... Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not a good not a good lander you might say you know yeah <laughs> I, I I don't want to test all my lives like a cat <laughs> I'm not always going to land on my feet so get me closer to the earth but yeah. you know those that those that love to fly or parachute or um you know be in helicopters that kind of stuff you know that's that's Shelly we've been been at off road parks where there's you know special event going on and they've got a you know, helicopter rides, and I'm like, go for it, and I'll sit and watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's jumped out of airplanes, and and I, I forget how many jumps she's had with, uh, you know, parachuting, and it's like, nope. Besides, you know, think about the kind of parachute I'd have to use, you know, right. like they used in World War II when they were dropping <laughs> those CJ, you know, those old uh, <laughs> CJ two A's or you know, they right. were military jeeps off of the out of the airplanes, and you know, I need one of those big cargo chutes. It'd look kind of look kind of odd. Yeah, but that's me. <laughs> yeah, I did it. I, it's kind of become a thing now that every time we go to Moab, we have to go skydiving again. Yeah, I don't. I don't get the fascination of jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. 
<laughs> you know, it's like, hey, I'm going to intentionally drop. You know, it's, yeah. I don't know. That's just me. I'm, it's not like I'm afraid to do it. It's, you know, I, I would imagine it's the, the th- you know, the thrill-seeking part. I've never been, a, you know, I love the adrenaline rushes and stuff. I just can't see myself jumping out of a plane when, you know, I don't like getting into them to begin with, so I don't see why jumping out of them at, at altitude yeah. is, uh, that's, but again, that, you know, it's just me. I, no, I, t- I totally understand it. Uh, I just, you know, I, I think part of it for me is wanting to push myself out of my comfort zone sometimes. Right. So, but I totally understand it and I will, I will never, ever make fun of you for it. I, oh no, I you can't because I do it. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, well, I would never make fun of anybody out there that didn't want to try it. Right. But if anybody did, then I'd always be willing to go with them. So it actually started out, the first time we did it, it started out as a dare between me and Mark, one of my employees. We were there in Moab, and it it was just him and I. And uh, it kind of turned into a dare, like, yeah, I'll go if you go. Well, okay, well, I'll go if you go. Before we knew it, the next morning we were headed out to the airport. So, and I think both of us thought the other one would back out before we got on the plane. <laughs> That's got to be a different view of the Red Rock and those cliffs and everything being being up in a an airplane or a or a helicopter in that area. Yeah, it is beautiful, and those guys at that that Moab. I don't know if Moab Sky Skydive Moab or whatever it is, they're super nice folks. We it's it's I could get queasy standing on top of a ladder. You know, you look down and you get that queasy feeling, but it's it's not the same when you're in an airplane because I guess the ground's so far away you don't have that your brain doesn't have that reference point to look down and say, Oh, that's gonna hurt when I fall. <laughs> I uh, but it's it's just not the same. You get up there and you're out on that plane and it's 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 and I don't know how to explain it. It's just different. But your brain doesn't reference being off the ground. Even when you look down at the ground, I guess it's so far away, you, you it just doesn't feel the same. And a lot of people like the you know, you talk to people that skydive and a lot of them like the fall, they like doing the flips and spins and all kinds of crazy stuff in the air. Mine goes back to the flying thing. I like after they've pulled the parachute and you just get to soar around and it's so super quiet and free. That's my favorite part of the skydiving is, is not the diving. It's the parachute part. So I always ask them to pull the chute as soon as possible so we can fly around. And uh, I, I enjoy that much more than the dive but like my wife she she loved the free fall yeah see that's the part that i'm not sure sure about i I think if the shoot once the shoot would come open i'd be much more relieved (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) instead of that wondering okay 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 is it gonna open that won't handle you so like mark is uh i don't know he's six four six five something like that and 250 pounds or so. I know. I know you're probably a pound or two over that. Oh but, yeah, uh, a few pounds over that. They had uh, they had this little bitty guy that was. He was like a young version of Polly Shore, and and I'm sure you remember who that is. Yes. A lot of your listeners probably won't know who Polly Shore is, but um, look it up. But he was he was a little bitty version of Polly Shore had the, had like little dreadlocks and, and things like that going on, but super fun character, but he was a little bitty guy. So they let him be small with Mark's big body. Okay. So anyway, you know, you're, you, you got the ultralight, you've, you're off in the four wheel drive industry for 20 plus years now. And, where do you see where do you see Matt Hodges at in say ten years? Oh what what's on your to do list? And I don't like calling them a bucket list. Right. I call them life lists. What's on your life list? 
I've always been pretty good about checking those things off as I, as I go. So my bucket list is pretty short, but, um, I have, uh, an 11 year old son and an eight year old daughter that I think that's going to be, I absolutely love watching them go play sports. And, uh, I'm hoping that ever it's going to be a, a center or a quarterback in the, in the local high school. And I'll get to be all of our older boys that have all moved off. I had so much fun going to those Friday night football games that I look forward to doing that with him and with her. I, she's such a good basketball player or getting to be such a good basketball player that I hope she'll do that. Um, and then I, uh, I have some land down in Fort McCavitt, which is, it's a very historical piece of land. It's been in our family for probably the fourth generation. And um, I want to build a house and have a nice quiet place by the lake. And uh, hopefully soon start having grandkids that'll come do that and hang out. I can teach them how to fish and take, take them wheeling down because it's only about, I don't know, probably 40 miles from Katimsky Rocks. Nice. Yeah, I, that's that's what I foresee in my future. I've already done so much, I guess, so-called wild and crazy stuff that uh, I'm ready to uh, just have fun with the next generation. How about travel? Is there anything, is there any part of the world that you would love to go see? Yes, absolutely. So um, I'm redheaded, freckle-faced, Scottish kid um, I would love uh, and I I got into uh, genetics and, and family tree stuff several years ago and have tracked my lineage back back to several castles in that area and I would love to go to Scotland and Ireland and, and kind of travel that area and see some of the old family homesteads and, and do that thing and, and I love to travel so yeah, I'm I'm all for any place I can go. I guess the next place I want to take my family. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a uh, like 20 days. We rented a motorhome and went up, went from here to the east coast and up, and then across and back down. It's all kinds of cool stuff. I think the next time I want to go west, um, take them to show them Yosemite and and uh, Rushmore and and Yellowstone back. and all that. Yeah, yeah. All of those. National and parks the, are awesome. Yes, they are. They are a treasure. They really are. We are so lucky to be living in the nation that we are and to have the things that we have. True. Very true. So have you for, have you gone to any foreign countries? Nothing more than um, just what's around the United States. Mexico, Canada. Nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, Virgin Islands, that, you know, that kind of stuff down in there. I know some of those islands are different countries, technically. Yeah. There's Dutch West Indies and the Virgin yeah. Islands. You have British. Yeah. And the American. Yeah, it's all. Yeah. So, Shelly and I have talked about doing Ireland. We want to take backpacks and then rent, like, small motorcycles or scooters yeah that sounds fun that way you don't have to worry about parking because the roads in ireland are really really narrow especially when you get out out in the countryside and then because i don't i'm not a big fan of big cities i don't care where we're at me neither uh, or any you know i mean we were in australia i loved being out up and down the coast out of sydney i loved being in the outback um, or the bush area. We never got into the outback, but you know, I did not. I did not like. I mean, it was great being there, but I didn't. I don't like the crowds. You know, people pushing and shoving, and you know, you're right. just having to deal with everybody around you. I've I've gotten to be. I'm not antisocial. I just that part of the experience in other countries, I'm not into. Um, right. Tokyo. That was a little different story because. That was, but that was a, I think the reason Tokyo amazed me was just the way the culture is over there and how, 
you know, I'm kind of a history buff. So, you know, things here in the United States, you know, three, 400 years old. And then you get over there and it's, you know, the buildings are still 15, 1600 years old and they're wood. Yeah. You know, it just blows your mind. You know, the kind of history that, that some of these cultures that most cultures have that we don't. So that's, uh. I, I, I enjoyed that part of it, but I really liked being out in the country in Japan as well. Yeah. My next place I'd really like to go, I think, is New Zealand. It looks beautiful. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the uh-huh. that's the part of it. You know, I'm not interested in being in their the large cities. I want to be out in the I want to be out exploring. Me too. I I, I love meeting people, but that was when we did our trip up the East Coast. New York was the only place that we really didn't enjoy ourselves. Um, it's a beautiful city, and they had lots of cool things to go do, but it's just crazy. It's it's too much, too much going on. And, and, and amazingly, the locals were the nicest people. It was all the other tourists that were coming in and they're not used to it and they're flustered and they're not being nice. And then, so everybody's running around, all the tourists are running around being rude to each other. And it's only the locals that are nice, (laughs) but, um, well, that's good to hear. And and I didn't get to speak Arabic several times in, in, uh, in New York. Cab drivers. No, actually store owners or things like that. Okay. Cool. But, um, yeah, that was the big. I'm not a big city guy anymore either. As a matter of fact, San Angelo's getting too big for me, and we're only at probably, I don't know, we're 130, 140 thousand people. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, it's getting there. It's it even at a hundred thousand people, it still felt like a, a just a big small town, but yeah, now it's starting to feel like a big town. That's what I love about um, Mason. Yeah. And that's why they have so many people moving there and moving in that direction. Yeah. Everybody that can't afford to live in Fredericksburg but l- works there is moving right. out of Fredericksburg and getting into the local, com- you know, the surrounding communities where they have to drive 40 or 50 miles just because prices have forced them out of the area that they work. It's crazy. Yeah. And but Randy's doing well in the real estate business because of it. Yes. Yeah. I can't afford big ranches. Yeah. I I couldn't afford the place that we have. There's no way. They just put the place across the river from us up for sale, and it's in the millions. Wow. So there's no way I could afford it. I'm I'm lucky enough that I have a great-grandfather that bought it and kept it, and uh, my grandmother left it to my mother and my mother's leaving it to me. So that's good. That's cool. uh, Yeah. I, I, you know, traveling here, trying to, you know, talking about off road stuff, I want to do the, uh, the Alpine loop, um, up in Colorado. That seems like a beautiful trail. Okay. I want to do the Rubicon. That seems like an absolutely beautiful trail. You've not done the Rubicon yet? I have not done the Rubicon. I have driven past it half a dozen times. Always too busy to stop and and drive. But And it breaks my heart to say say it, but no, I have not done the Rubicon. We will have to figure that out. (laughs) Or if and when you decide to do it, and if I can't be there, then... Let me know, and I can get you hooked up with some people that, because I really believe that the Rubicon is a much better experience if you go with people that know the area, because oh, of course, you know you get the good camp areas. They, I, I really recommend people take you know their first trip go Jeepers Jamboree, with uh, you know that Sweeney and all those guys. They really take good care of you. There's, you know, trail help along the way, not that you need any help on the trail, but, you know, they, they get you in the right direction and keep you on the trail. Yeah. You know, it's it's just, and then they serve, the food they serve there is great. You know, you meet so many people that are in the industry or enthusiasts that uh, 
that you know have uh, that have a lot of shared experiences. So that's always a good trip for a first time. Well, food would be a problem. I'd make Randy Cruzy go with me. And if you've ever been on a trip or anything with Randy, you eat well with Randy. So, <laughs> well, they do a really good job up there. They have uh, cook crews that come up, and those people are cooking breakfast, preparing lunch, and then dinner that culminates with this great steak dinner that they do on uh, the Saturday night that's just phenomenal but they they wonderful. really they really do a good job with it up there but yeah we'd uh, I'd love to get you out there on the Rubicon it's uh you know it's I consider it my home trail you should yeah, get up to know. uh try to get up to South Dakota for the South Dakota Challenge or whatever they happen to call that up there and it's uh that's a really that's a really beautiful area as well Randy was telling me, and it's been a couple of years, but uh, there's some event because he does the the Land Cruiser Roundup every year, and right. it's all Toyota guys, and um, and they're kind of their own breed of off roaders. But supposedly, there's a Toyota only event that happens. It starts, I don't know, up in the northwest somewhere, and um, it goes all the way up to Alaska, but it's only on bad roads. They spend about a week going through, and I don't know why, but that sounded like a lot of fun too. It does that one? I don't know about. I want to do that uh, that trail across America or whatever they. Um, it's called Tat, and it's uh, it actually goes from Oregon to like South or North Carolina, and you can do. It's probably eighty to ninety percent off-road or off That's pavement awesome. i want to try that sometime of course i i don't have the time now to do it all in one one push but we'll get time eventually that's that's the kind of trips i like yeah absolutely well cool that sounds like a lot of fun so is there anything that we haven't discussed that uh that you think people would be interested in oh i don't know i guess that at this point, I'd like to just say, you know, hey, Matt, thank you for coming on board and sharing your life with uh, our listeners and hope that uh, hope for hope for you to have all the success in the world and everything that you want to have happen, all your dreams and aspirations come true. Well, thank you, Rich, and I, I hope the same for you, but I'm already the richest man in the world. I have I have everything that I hoped and dreamed for as a young man, so I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm not... I'm not a millionaire, but I stay busy every day and I make a decent living and have a, I don't have a mansion on the hill, but I have great kids and an awesome wife and wonderful friends. And that does make you rich. It does. It does. That's success. So, my grandfather, you, my grandfather always said, you know, it's not about how much money you make in life. It's how you get to live your life. Yes, Absolutely. Well, Matt, thank you very much for uh, spending some time, and uh, I hope to see you this off season. We'll be back in the uh, Texas area. We'll have to get together and maybe uh, go out and visit your property. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Cool. Well, thank you for spending the time. Oh, thank you for having me. All right. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a rating. Share some feedback with us via Facebook or Instagram and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much.